Well, thank you so much. It's such an honor to uh, be invited to talk uh, in this series. Um, there's some pictures on this first slide here of us working at the Harbor Springs Area Historical Society. And the one in the middle is at uh, the Little Traverse Historical Museum in Petoskey. And uh, I will be talking about this project and not generally necessarily about Waganaxing quill work. Um, I am a professor of anthropology at Michigan State University. I have an adjunct staff appointment with the MSU Museum. And uh, I teach also courses in the American Indian Studies program that I'm affiliated as well. Uh, I think I'll just leave that for introductions of myself for now because I wanted to start first by, um, in addition to thanking you for this opportunity, uh, really uh, thanking um, and acknowledging the relationships with, with, within which this work is situated and the collaboration with the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa, in particular, the Archives and Records Office um, and humbly guided by Yvonne Walker Kishik, as well as with the work and insights from Eric Hemingway, uh, Jenna Wood and Judy Piersnowski, and in many other conversations who I'm honored to have been given the time to help carry this work out. Um, so this includes the ability to visit and get to know the living and documentary records in local and other collections, museums, uh, including the Harbor Springs Area Historical Society. Uh, special thanks to Beth. And I'd also, I don't think Jane Garver's here tonight, but I wanted to acknowledge her from the Little Traverse Historical Museum in Petoskey. Um, I wanted to just say a little bit too about my collaborators here, Judy Piersnowski and Jenna Wood. Uh, both of them were, were students at MSU. Both of them have graduated. Uh, Judy graduated 2019 uh, and uh, Jenna just this past year from the apparel and textile design program. I just wanted to note she's a very talented artist and uh, was featured in MSU today uh, with her mask made of birch bark and four pine quills that eventually was uh, displayed in an exhibit at the Denos Museum in Traverse City. And uh, so um, very uh, honored and humbled to work with these two ladies in addition to with Eric and Yvonne. Um, so this might not be quite the presentation you expect. I'm not an expert on Anishinaabe co-work. And so I'll not be talking so much about the aesthetics or the techniques of making co-work or anything like that. That expertise, of course, lies not with just the individual makers, but with the uh, within the intergener intergenerational relationships of makers and the animals, plants, and elements that uh, Yvonne Kishik calls the genealogy of quill work. So I want to first acknowledge that her framing uh, in these terms of the genealogy of quill work and these relationships is what's guided this project. Um, I'm trained as, and I'm a professor of anthropology, but the defining thread of my work has largely been as a facilitator to commu communicate that sharing dimension uh, in ways that support indigenous um, people's cultural priorities as defined by them, by themselves. And sometimes often actually requires the cooperation and collaboration, learning and understanding development among non-indigenous people. So my work is often about helping lift barriers to those processes by assembling research, whether it's from archives or museum collections or through ethnographic methods like doing interviews or um, other things that anthropologists do, engaging in systematic observation, for example, and pulling all of those pieces together. So in this project that I'll be talking about today um, is really aimed first of all, at producing a web-based resource or a portal that assembles a range of Waganaxing materials that have journeyed to numerous locations into private and public collections. Um, the resources serve the Waganaxing community, or the, this new resource will serve the Waganaxing community in making these digitally accessible for teaching and learning within the community, as well as externally oriented to the broader public uh, like those of you who are here tonight. 
the hope for the Waganoxian portal is that it will be a gateway to cultural heritage items and discussions by digitally drawing together materials held locally and across the country and internationally into some sort of centralized indigenous uh, community curated platform. And the project's focused on creating a pilot. This current project this year is, is working on a pilot uh, interactive tool for that portal uh, that is really focused on serving indigenous makers um, and seeing how we can use that to educate the broader public grounded again in the experience of teachers like Yvonne who has been doing that for many years. Um, so uh, this project is supported by a fellowship from the Whiting Foundation and the process for creating the portal which initially focuses on porcupine quill work traditions as I said uh, we're doing that because of the way it aligns with Waganoxing initiatives supporting historical and traditional arts knowledge while cultivating intercultural respect and understanding. Uh, Waganoxing porcupine quill work is a beautiful decorative art, but it's also significant and profound uh, in terms of a cultural practice that represents Waganoxing's story. The art embodies the respectful relationships between human and non-human relation world, um, and uh, is interwoven in Waganoxing oral traditions and storytelling relating to the responsible gathering and protection of resources, the history of trade and relations with uh, non-Indigenous people, and how uh, Waganoxing artists really play a central role in perpetuating cultural knowledge and educating non-Indigenous neighbors about respect for the tribal way of life. So this is where I really want to plug this new book that uh, Eric Hemingway has co-authored with um, his collaborator, Ger Gerard Van Bussel at um, the uh, Weltmuseum Wien in Vienna, Austria. And that, that museum houses a really important collection of Waganoxing materials. The books available from MSU Press, full disclosure, I'm on the board of MSU Press, uh, but this book is an amazing example of uh, knowledge sharing based on that cumulative uh, or accumulation of years of collaboration and uh, just an absolute wealth of information and story brought together through uh, piecing together the historical and contemporary journey journeys of the materials in that particular museum. And uh, you'll see Yvonne again is featured in the book. She uh, participated in some of those consultations in Vienna and visited the collections there and uh, so there's a little piece in there that is from a interview that they did with her while she was visiting. Um, so just to kind of reiterate um, some of the things I've already said but again you know kind of what's behind this project is you know again not cool work as a beautiful piece of art which it certainly is um, but again about uh, how, as uh, Eric's book illustrates, is featured in those relationships with European visitors to the Waganoxing territory, um, embodies those fundamental relationships of reciprocal, uh, of a reciprocal nature uh, that Yvonne uh, speaks to. Uh, and then there's a couple of other themes that are <clears throat> underlie this project. Uh, the, it's not necessarily in this kind of timeline or chronology. But there's certainly a period when commercial collector market uh, in the early 20th century layers on an economic dimension that um, entangles quill work with the growth of tourism and uh, Waganoxing lands. Uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, of course, in maybe the more recent decades too, the way in which uh, sustainable environmental stewardship has been at the forefront uh, and really requiring intercultural cooperation between all of us. Uh, as we're engaged in the expansion of recreation, parklands, sports hunting and fishing, resource extraction, and the way that climate change as well is impacting the environment, environment and, and closing off more and more access and to uh, threatening biodiversity. And so um, that's another really important underlying message that um, comes across in this project and from Waganoxing artists more generally. Um, Let's see if I wanted to say anything else about that there. Um, 
I just wanted to mention too, the Great Lakes Research Alliance um, for Aboriginal Arts and Culture I've had an association with them, um, some background with them that uh, is somewhat related to this project in that this is a group of uh, an, an alliance, obviously, of, uh, of researchers who have over the years uh, put together a database and um, based on their research visits to numerous collections, many of which are in Europe. And uh, this database was created as a way of bringing together kind of like our purposes too. So we have that inspiration from this purpose of bringing together not just material items, but um, documentary um, archival materials and things like that so that the uh, these pieces have been kind of separated out into these various journeys into collections and uh, a, a digital database can have that um, um, purpose of bringing them back together and putting them more easily in conversation when you can find things that um, are can be aligned in particular ways. And uh, so this database was created to try and do that. Uh, it's been a little bit difficult to it's not necessarily been user-friendly over the years, so it's gone through a number of uh, iterations um, and uh, is still currently in the process of being redeveloped. So uh, this project's not necessarily going to be directly um, engaged with that, but it's certainly, there's so much data that has already been, all, so much work that's already been done by people associated with the Grass Act database, that that's an element that will help feed into this project extensively because there's certainly a lot of Waganox and core work uh, that's been discussed that uh, by the researchers associated with this, um, this alliance, but also uh, the, the database itself. So I just wanted to mention that as kind of a, a parallel to this uh, digital platform that we're building. Okay, and another major source of inspiration for this project is the MSU Museum. Um, and this is Judy, who initially served as an intern while she was completing her bachelor's degree. And her, her job at the time mainly focused on accessioning a major donation of coal boxes from Catherine C. Vale. And uh, so I think it was about 160, 160 or 170 coal boxes that uh, Mrs. Vale collected between 1978 and about 2016. She passed away in 2018. Uh, and she also donated alongside this uh, box of documentary files that she had kept over the years um, uh, and built up over the years in association with her collection. And I just- hey, read Heather, a, Yes. Just real quick. Is there any way you can go full screen with your slides? Um, let me see if I can. Whoops, took me back to the beginning. There we go, perfect. People just wanted to read them a little bit easier. Okay, uh, I might need to I might need to switch back and forth. Um, I'm just gonna get rid of this too, so. You'll just yell at me again because I, I turned off the video so I can't see anybody. No problem, I'll let you know. Okay, is that, I hope that's better. Um, so uh, I just thought I would say a little bit more about uh, Mrs. Vale. Uh, her, uh, she passed away when she was 95 in 2018. She was from Ohio, but she spent almost every summer of her life at her cottage in uh, Indian River on Burt Lake. And um, she, her, this is from her obituary. It says, quote, she was also famous for her amazing collection and knowledge of Native American porcupine coal boxes. Her extensive collection has been donated by her children to Michigan State University Museum in her name. She delivered many lectures on the history of coal boxes and shared the process of how the craft is created. And so another theme kind of going through this project, of course, is the importance of collectors and uh, especially a lot of this kind of ephemera or documentary files and things like that that they uh, saw as important in the process of their collecting and how they shared their collections with other people and so on. Uh, and so I'll give a few examples of that as well. Um, and Judy, I just want to mention too, really brings to the table a maker's eye. Um, in the pro in, when she was in the process of accessioning this collection, which you see on the table here in this picture on the left is the Catherine Vale collection. I think that's 
mostly the cat might be other pieces that's not from the Catherine Vale. Yeah, there's a few things that are not necessarily from that collection, but um, quite a few pieces that are. And uh, she, uh, as a maker, really was able to add a lot of dimension to the description files for each quill box, was able to identify things like techniques and styles and make corrections on um, the identification of materials utilized, for example. And the other thing she did was really take a lot of photographs of the boxes from many different angles that would be of interest to makers. And um, in our museum collection, as is the case often in museum collections, even if the, there are photographs of the pieces available online, there's not often more than <clears throat> maybe four or five pictures that at most usually that kind of take the, you know, the outside of the box, the top, Maybe the side, uh, maybe the maybe maybe the bottom if there's something interesting on the bottom. But um, there's a you know usual kind of a standard process of uh, of the way that uh, museum pieces are photographed, uh, either in uh, databases internally to the museum or uh, even on, in these online databases. You might find even less availability of the range of photographs that uh, might have been taken of a particular item. Um, so you'll maybe see why that becomes important as I go along here. Um, so at about this time, we also, this is kind of 2018 or so when that, um, or 2016 was when that collection was donated, 2017, 2018. We organized a meeting of makers uh, in Petoskey. And um, the point of that was to really think through uh, how uh, this digital resource, you know, so there's discussion, what we're talking about, some people might call digital repatriation. And that's not necessarily quite what we're doing. I mean, it is to a degree, but there's also been a lot of critiques of um, the, the limits of digital repatriation, right? Like you don't get to handle these things and see them and play around with them in, in front of you and smell them and touch them and so on. And so, that with that said, there are still perhaps ways we can improve digital resources um, and, and open up the opportunities that the digital resource could provide. So this is just a, a list of some of the things that uh, came out of that meeting. Uh, as I just illustrated with what Judy did at MSU Museum, Museum, making much more specific and detailed information about the materials and techniques available. There's the possibility of incorporating videos uh, on maker on making, but also on the maker's story and intention, uh, talking about maybe particular piece. While you can also, uh, you know, look at the piece from a, a range of dimensions and learn more about its history and context and so on uh, by connecting all of these pieces together in one one place. Um, one of the most important things that's come across uh, in my work with uh, Yvonne and others in uh, the Waganoxing community is how important it is to acknowledge, uh, you know, say who your teachers are and acknowledge teachers. And that's often definitely not part of the museum record. Um, so that's something that um, is, that, again, that genealogy uh, is important to include. Maybe a digital space can also provide uh, opportunity for makers themselves to carry out their own research, to publish it in, a, in the online in that space maybe have exhibitions, that kind of thing in that space. Um, it's a place where you might find, you could build an archive of designs and patterns. Uh, it obvious, it can also provide a space for people to connect um, and uh, between teachers and learners, but also um, makers to items, especially in uh, physically located areas that are difficult to access. Uh, and then the other thing about it is that it's a living kind of place. So you can, it's not um, in stasis. It can be constantly updated and changed and engaged with over time. So it has a lot of uh, those kinds of benefits that makers felt uh, from that meeting uh, could go into this project. Um, let's see. So, um, just want to make sure I didn't forget anything here. Um, so yeah, so following on that work, um, that's when this, pro this project that's funded by the Whiting Foundation got started officially, of course, in spring of 2020. Uh, so we immediately had to adjust uh, to all the limitations of COVID 
And I know that, you know, maybe it sounds like it's a digital project, so couldn't it just continue unfettered by uh, the pandemic? But we, you know, we're really engaged in Indigenous research practices, and that really involves a lot of extensive community-based relational connection, uh, which was impeded a lot by the restriction on in-person activities. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we made some progress, we made some adjust adjustments, and we're able to do a few in-person activities once that became safer. Um, this is one example here uh, that uh, uh, Jenna Wood designed an interview tool to talk to co workers. In, um, and, uh, you know, eventually we can develop that uh, as a part of the project. We haven't started yet, though. Uh, she did this one interview with Yvonne. This is a still shot from their, uh, in their uh, talk in the fall of 2020, sitting outside Yvonne's house. Um, uh, setting it up as safely as possible. And um, I just wanted to add here too that Yvonne herself had interviewed many coworkers earlier in the, in the 2000s. And so there's an intergenerational continuity and consistency of this research within the community with the questions being formulated based on Yvonne's previous questions, but also with Jenna's own additions here. So these are really the kinds of questions that Jenna as a young member of the tribe is interested in asking her elder uh, about that she's integrated into, into this, uh, these questions. So it's not me as the anthropologist designing <laughs> the questionnaire. Um, then uh, one of the things that Judy worked on during this time too, was learning to create an experiment with 3D images and um, how and where this kind of uh, tool could be useful in the digital resource. Uh, so uh, the other thing that the, Je both Jenna and Judy did was generate an inventory of Waganoxin cohort, compiling our, um, our work uh, in a co collaborative platform I'll talk about in a little bit. But um, all of this was added in perspective from Julie, Judy's earlier experience uh, in, working in the MSU Museum. This is her again uh, on another occasion. Um, talking with Elizabeth Kimelon, who was being recorded uh, talking about the names of the designs on the quill boxes in our collection in the Anishinaabe language. And, uh, you know, sadly, Elizabeth has walked on and um, just really drives home the importance and the possibilities as well for the digital platform of adding language contributions as another dimension um, that can be included there. And uh, so this is actually Judy's 3D. This is a quill box that she made herself, uh, her own quill box, and uh, is a 3D image. I'm just gonna try and see if I can show that to you. So I know I have to stop sharing and go here and then share again to show you this. So hopefully you can all see that. And um, this is an image that you can actually move and look at the cool box from all its different sides. Um, zoom in on and zoom out. And so this again, is just another tool that um, has emerged uh, out of our collab various collaborations and in integrating into this project. I'll just go back to the other slides. All right. So this is the um, the uh, inventory um, that we did. So this is just a, a snapshot of the inventory that we did as a part of establishing a process to. Uh, find the, the journeys of where, where locations where there are substantial Waganox and Quill, Quill work, uh, collections, um, trace those journeys. Uh, yeah. Could you uh, go back to, to the full screen? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot about that. Yep. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of just developing a tool using some questions that we, we, you know, we look to follow consistently as we go through from one collection to another. And again, the, these questions, um, what we call Waganoxing Collections Research Focus Questions, 
revolve around uh, thinking about these pieces as kin to the Waganaxing people. Uh, so we're looking at what are their relationships, what have been their journeys, what is the Odawa story, how have they been taken care of relationally, uh, and uh, how can we unmute the teacher voices of Odawa co-work uh, in this process. This project is probably only just uh, scratching the surface of the first part of question one. Uh, and um, we've identified at this point uh, 28 facilities with Waganoxin co-work that spans time from the early 1800s to the present. Um, and, you know, you know, again, these facilities are located in the US, Canada, Europe, and that of course includes the Vienna Museum now well documented by Eric, uh, as well as the other digital inventor inventories that, that have been done by the folks associated with the Grass Act work. Um, and uh, so we were able to you know, really think about planning how we might need to visit some collections, photograph items, and digitize the related documents and other things that may be uh, in these collections, Priority prioritizing those where we could perhaps uh, serve local smaller facilities like the Harbor Springs Area Historical Society or where the availability and capacity for existing online materials is a bit lower. So some of these are in Michigan um, and we're already part of the project, but as we were doing our research, we uh, thought about how we could incorporate some other visits such as uh, to um, some in Wisconsin and uh, in California that I'll turn to next. Um, and these are just some examples. This first one is the Albert Green Heath collection that's at the Logan Museum in Beloit, Wisconsin. Um, and Heath was a, a resident of, of Harbor Springs. And it's interesting because his collecting covers an important period in our efforts to trace that intergenerational genealogy from, for example, the period prior to 1850 uh, documented by Eric and the Vienna Museum and other locations to uh, this period between the 1850s and the 1900s when uh, Heath was collecting. So uh, this museum is uh, at Beloit College in Wisconsin and it has this extensive collection from the Waganoxin community uh, because Heath, although he was born in Chicago, his family summered in Harbor Springs and um, I, you know he's on the census throughout numerous years, and he, when he passed away, he um, has been buried in the Lakeview Cemetery. So he's um, a local guy in a sense, um, but he was a really important collector. He, uh, his official uh, profession was quote Indian curio seller. And uh, that was on his business card and he acquired items from all over North America. He was a buyer for Gustav Hay, which, whose collection forms the basis of the National Museum of the American Indian. Uh, and uh, Hay in particular acquired quite a few items from Heath in 1918. So it kind of gives us a sense of the time period of the collection and how it fits into this um, broader genealogical story. Uh, he didn't have any descendants, so his sister uh, ended up with his collection when he passed away, and she happened to have been a student at Beloit, and so she wanted that collection to go there. It's kind of an interesting story unto itself, but essentially um, the museum couldn't afford to buy it from her. She wasn't donating it to them, uh, and so they set up a process whereby they, they um, identified what they called um, duplicates and um, retained uh, one of each of what they thought, one or more of each of some of these things and sold off the rest in order to raise the money in order to acquire the collection. And so uh, the museum itself, I think retains around a thousand pieces and uh, there were nearly 3000 pieces in the collection overall. So those things got scattered uh, to numerous other sites, uh, but fortunately, um, there's a, the museum also produced a little booklet that lists all of the museums who bought pieces. So that's helped us in our in our research as well in tr in tracking down those journeys. But as you can see, there's these are some really interesting pieces in that particular collection. Just noted here that Yvonne visited this collection in 1999 and helped with them. Uh, and some of their records reflect her visit and some of the help that she did at that time, uh, identifying some of the pieces. 
Uh, and I just threw this in here. I just thought it was interesting in doing our research about Heath, we came across this picture that was supposedly taken by him in uh, perhaps 1907. And uh, it's, de it's described as an Ottawa Indian family in traditional, in traditional dress might be Harbor Springs. So uh, I just thought I'd throw this in here to see if um, attend the attendees today might pick up on uh, something in this picture or um, you know have something more to say about this picture as it relates to Heath himself somehow. Uh, didn't wanna pass by that opportunity. Uh, just moving on to this other example, which is the Autry uh, Southwest Museum and uh, in um, California. And this is one that Yvonne alerted us to a long time ago. Uh, and uh, in particular, we're talking here about the uh, Martha Berry Memorial Collection. Um, again, another person collecting during an, an interesting time. The collection was acquired in 1936, and there's some other individual items, small collections in this in this museum that are interesting um, for the place where it fits in our story. Uh, and maybe just say a few things about her. Martha Berry um, was from Detroit, and um, she was born in 1869, and died when she was 52 in 1921. And she had been visiting her sister in California. And um, so it was her sister later on that uh, donated the collection to the museum and why, you know, why it ended up out there in California. But the, this is an important, uh, very wealthy family from Detroit. They were part of the Berry Brothers Varnish Factory, which were uh, the, at one point noted as the wealthiest family uh, in Wayne County uh, at around the turn of the century. And uh, so just another interesting connection, um, you know, probably, presumably, uh, you know, another family that summered in Harbor Springs and uh, was part of that collecting scene uh, during that era that um, we we're, we're looking to make some specific connections to there. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about Frances Palethorpe. Uh, maybe this uh, Mrs. Palethorpe or Miss Palethorpe uh, is familiar to some of you who are on the call. This is an extensive collection in the Little Traverse Historical Museum in Petoskey. And we had such, um, I'm looking forward to going back and uh, working there again. Uh, uh, bringing back all of the, we scanned every page of Mrs. Palethorpe's uh, extensive um, journals and notes uh, and uh, to be able to return that to the museum so they have a digital copy of all of that. And of course they have quite an extensive collection of pull boxes. I think I saw Adriana Gretchi Green uh, joining us today, which is fantastic because Adriana has done a lot of work, uh, including um, a lot of pieces that's in this collection, um, talking about this era in the 1930s and the WPA. Um, and I, I wanna say it's 2012, I hope she can correct me, um, published a really nice article in the American Indian Art Magazine about this work uh, and uh, Frances Palethorpe's uh, connection to that work. Um, but for our purposes, uh, we're just really interested, as I said, in kind of thinking about how do we piece together this, uh, the, make these connections, uh, that genealogical connection? This is just one example of um, a box that not only had, um, this is probably from the 1930s, maybe from that WPA area, era, um, but another, you know, there's a note, little piece of paper inside where she's listed off all of the pool workers and where they're from and so on. And there's an ex quite a bit of detail in her writing uh, about the quill workers she knew. Ms. Uh, Frances Palethorpe was an art teacher who worked in Petoskey, taught in Petoskey uh, for half of the 20th century from the beginning of the 1900s all the way through the 1950s. Uh, and so, uh, and as an art teacher, she was particularly interested uh, in quilt, the art of quill work and uh, had extensive relationships with a number of quill workers. Uh, this is Jenna taking a closer look at that box. You can see um, 
uh, Francis writing on the bottom stuff, writing all over stuff. <laughs> um, so there's just a whole lot of information there uh, that uh, is great to kind of bring together in one place to make it easier for people to sort through and look at and connect to other pieces. Um, and this is just um, kind of a, a collage of uh, one file folder, I think, uh, probably that I had opened when I was there and just snapped a picture of it laying on the table where you have, um, as an artist, she liked to copy the designs off the quill, quill boxes. Um, this is a piece I think she made several versions of that I saw in her art books there uh, that uh, she says is a piece by Margaret Boyd, uh, who, you, who people on the call most likely know is Andrew Blackbird's sister. Uh, and uh, there's an amazing picture of her in the Harbor Springs Area Historic Sloan Museum. Um, and uh, then, you know, it's the, the issue with Francis Palethorpe's papers is that they're not necessarily organized in any particular way. There's a lot of this stuff kind of thrown in together. And as you also might know, not a single date on anything. So it's really quite a lot to try and sort out. There's lots of times where she's typed up things that she's written elsewhere and there's many copies of the same thing, but maybe it's not quite the same thing uh, and so on. So there's just a, a really rich resource here, but a lot to go on to uh, make those connections to uh, the journeys of quill work throughout all these other collections. Um, and then finally, um, going to the Harbor Springs, so, you know, last but not least, for sure. Um, and a, a lot comes together in the collections at the Harbor Springs Area Historical Society because of its history and the way it spans, the collection spans um, across all of these kind of relations and others. And uh, um, at the same time, you know, has some interesting pieces specific to particular periods and particular makers and collectors, uh, including, for example, this collection on loan from the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa that has a number of pieces that really reflect that familial, gen generational, um, teaching, learning kind of genealogies in aspects such as the style, the edging, the finishing, uh, and how people were beginning to sign their works in the 1980s. Uh, there's also the Wilbur Symes collection. Um, maybe you'll see a bit of familiarity here in this box with the orange uh, on it that is very similar to the one with the turquoise on it that Jenna was looking at in Petoskey. Um, and uh, just representing a wide range of connections in uh, Wilbur Symes's uh, collection here to um, the way that we can put together the documentation digitally through all of these pieces on the slide. You just see something from uh, these tiny little canoes that are like tourist pieces to, uh, again, probably pieces connected to the WPA era. Uh, and then um, these uh, full covered boxes um, that are uh, the more desirable kind of pieces that you see in the in the collectors and um, as art pieces collection for collectors uh, coming together in this one collection. Um, and I think that is that this will be my last slide and I just wanted to really uh, put these pieces together here on this last side that really illustrate that it's not at all about kind of the simplicity uh, or complexity of quill work as aesthetic objects, but how they're linked together uh, through time and um, in relation to each other along a genealogical continuum of the Odawa story. Uh, this here on the right is a picture, is an absolute masterpiece of Yvonne's that is housed in the MSU Museum collections, but it's been exhibited numerous times. Maybe some of you had the opportunity um, last fall to see the wonderful, amazing exhibit that was in Petoskey uh, at Crooked Tree. And, um, you know, I mean, this is <laughs> this just embodies um, Yvonne's incredible talent, but also the, uh, the teaching aspect of it, uh, just in terms of all of the story that it represents. And even though the box on the left seems quite simple, uh, and uh, it, it is a completely connected 
uh, in terms of the, the way that the quo work story uh, relates to uh, those points that I was making at the beginning about the way that it under, underlies the uh, relationships, the human, human and non-human relationships. Um, and just as an aside, that box I noticed had a little note inside that says Mrs. O'Damon on it. And so that person is probably a direct ancestor of Yvonne's as well. So I'll just uh, end there, uh, jump out of here. Um, don't know if you want me to stop sharing or I can always turn this back on if you wanna look at anything in particular. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Heather. That's that was wonderful. And I, you know, I sort of had a sneak peek when you were here, um, looking at our full boxes and, and the items in our collection about what this project is, is going to be. And it's fascinating that you're only just at the beginnings of, of the project. And I, I think I speak for everyone when I say I can't wait to see in a couple of years when the portal is complete, and it has this entire database of quill work, um, Odawa quill work from across, you know, the world in one place. That'll be really interesting to see all of the connections between artists and makers. Um, and we do have a couple of questions. So I will go ahead and read some of these to you. Um, let me quickly scroll down here. We had a couple of questions about how the materials themselves are collected. Um, you know, sweet grass and, and birch bark, that kinds of thing. If you wanna speak to that um, quickly. If you don't, if you don't mind, I I think as I said off the top, I'm not a maker and I'm not an expert. And while I I have a, a a rudimentary understanding of those, you know, to answer that question, I don't feel it's rightly my place to answer that question. A uh, couple of things is I I do see uh, some makers who are on on the call, and I would most certainly welcome them to tell us about that. Uh, but I don't want to put them on the spot, but I do, I do see um, Jenna's here, for example. Uh, and, uh, but if she feels comfortable uh, sharing, that would be great. Ah, hi, Jenna. <laughs> and Jenna, I so you can unmute yourself if you'd like to, if you'd like to help answer that question. Hello. Hey. Bouju. Uh question about um, gathering the materials. Um, I'm not really sure. I, I don't know uh, how, like I, you just go out there and get them. I, I don't really know how else to explain. Um, birch bark, uh, summer bark for uh, cool boxes. Um, you get kind of like when it's been really hot for a few days and you have to peel it down to a certain or peel it off the tree at a certain layer because um, if you like cut it too deep, then it could kill the tree. But if you get it just to the right spot, um, then the bark will grow back in a couple of years. Um, uh, for sweetgrass, there's also a specific time in the summer that you get it. Um, usually Yvonne says that you get it before the 4th of July um, because um, the bugs uh, get bad and they like hatch in the grass. So if you don't, or if you get it late and you don't treat, um, like you're supposed to soak your grass so that you like heat treat it and the grass like folds into itself so that if there's anything in the grass, it'll kill it. And there's no bugs that will stay alive that will eventually start eating through the grass. She has told me a story of, of uh, a box that she saw where there's literally just like holes eaten through the grass over time. Um, for the last picture that you show or that you showed um, with Miss O'Damon, um, O'Damon's name in the box and then Yvonne's box next to it. Um, I also wanted to comment on the material of that because not it's not just the genealogy of the box, but um, there is cedar root on the box from Mrs. O'Damon. So it's, um, it kind of shows like the progression of how um, the art form has changed, um, not just within like uh, the intricacies of the design, but as well as the materials. And that has been heavily influenced by um, 
actually someone in my family uh, who um, sold Yvonne's boxes when she was young, uh, Victor Kishigo, my great uncle, um, he liked having the sweet grass around the boxes. So that's why um, Yvonne puts the sweet grass around the boxes now. And um, I'm not sure why they stepped away from using the cedar root, um, but I know that cedar does keep um, like bugs away. Uh, so like when boxes were used for, for um, like storage of seeds and um, other whatever whatever else you store in your box um, that was a kind of a natural way to keep keep it clean so uh, I hope that answers your question thank you I think that's actually exactly what they were hoping to learn um, about the materials and the relationship between the materials and gathering them and the the boxes in the process. Um, we did have someone else who um, wanted to wanted to know the, the contact name and address for this project. I think we had several people on this call who um, have quill boxes in their family or inherited quill boxes um, from this area who maybe are interested in contacting you um, about them. So um, if you don't mind, Heather, do you wanna put your contact information in the chat? or the project's contact information, however you wanna do that. Um, and that way it'll be available for everybody. Um, and let's see, uh, we had another question about the difference between uh, defining the word Odawa versus Waganakasein. Um, I sort of answered it in the chat, but Heather, if you'd like to speak to that. Oh, I'm just looking at your answer there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, so I mean, Waganoxing is very specific to the area, the, uh, the crooked tree, and, you know, the importance, the central importance of that in the story of the people of that area. Uh, and Odawa refers to the larger um, part of the Anishinaabe Confederacy of which the o Odawa are a part, right? So, um, in part, you know, with the um, Ojibwe and Potawatomi and kind of think of them having the naming in, in that sense too. So as you get broader out, then, you know, the names get less specific. And I see Jenna wants to jump in again too. So that's great. Go ahead. No, you're, you're good. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, the word itself, the people of the Kirka tree, Waganaka sing. Um, I'm just a beginner of the language, but wag, the og, means like the curve, um, like anything that, like a blackberry tree, it has the og in it, or um, yeah, or like the word for crooked knife, it has the og, so that's part of the word. And then the end of the word, uh, I believe the kissing is like, referring to like the shores, referring to like a, like the white pebble shores. That's what I've been told. Thanks. Perfect. Um, if anybody has any final questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we did have uh, uh, someone asking if there's anyone in our area who still teaches this art. Um, I know that Yvonne uh, Walker Kishik, she did some quill workshops for the Historical Society about five or six years ago now. Um, and I did, I talked with her daughter recently and she's not doing uh, much teaching anymore, but um, I do believe there are other makers and artists in the area. Heather, do you, do you know of anyone who's teaching actively right now? Well, I mean, hopefully this part of this purpose of this project is to be able to, and you know, make sure that that um, can be facilitated, but it's true that uh, it's very difficult to, you know, just be able to teach uh, and make a living and make a living and, you know, be engaged with all the other parts of life that you need to do to make a living. Um, and yeah, Yvonne uh, has not, you know, necessarily been teaching as much as she could in the past. And I don't know if she plans on doing any more teaching this coming year. She, does, she had in the past done a workshop once a year that 
um, was with the gallery in Cross Village, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. And that just fills up immediately. <laughs> so it's really, you know, not easy to get, e get into that even, uh, but that's a week long workshop. That's a, you know, kind of a major thing and that, you know, you do need to, you do need to do that. And I think the key thing about this too, is it, as Jenna was just talking about and answering the question about gathering, it really is a long-term apprenticeship kind of way that one learns this practice. It's not just, um, you know, although of course there are workshops where you can go for the nat for the day and maybe the teacher has already prepared for you the quills and sorted them out for you ahead of time and cut the birch bark for you and made a kit for you, that it doesn't, you know, that oh, it doesn't really get at the underlying process of really learning this art. And it takes a lot of practice and time and apprenticeship. Um, let's see if we have any more final questions. We did have someone who wanted to make a comment. Margaret, did you want to unmute quickly? Did you have a question? No, I'd like to make a comment. Go ahead. I thought I took Yvonne's courses for five years and she told stories through all the long weeks that we were there. So we learned a ton. And one of the things that really obtains as far as this genealogy concept goes is we asked her if as we were getting better and better and better at making the quill boxes, how legitimate were they in the sense that we were not Odawa. And she was very clear about it. She said, this has been discussed formally. And if you sign your box and date it on the bottom, it will be considered a legitimate part of our artistic heritage, artistic heritage even though you're not an Odawa tribal member. Just thought you'd be interested in that as a part of the genealogy. Well, thank you, Margaret. And I know she made that point during her uh, workshops with us as well, that um, uh, that she was, you know, the, the teacher and we were learning from her and um, she learned from her teacher, Susan Shaganabi. And, and so there was this sort of continuation of, of teaching. Um, there is, there are more questions. I'm glad that I asked before we close up. Um, Serene would like to know what the original utilitarian use of quill boxes were before they were, you know, sort of tourist items. Yeah, so they were storage boxes. And actually, referring once again to Eric's new book and the little piece that Yvonne has in there answers that question very specifically, where she explains how they were actually much larger and the, would, the quill work designs on the top would refer to what's inside the box. And those boxes would be stored in a cache. So they were bigger boxes of food and things like that, that you could go to throughout um, uh, the different seasons to uh, you know, get things that you might've dried and stored in there to have them throughout the year. Right, I, I remember one of her workshops. She she called quill boxes the original Tupperware. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, they, so that's uh, that's the utilitarian use there. Um, another question, um, Mary would like to know if there are any parallels within other indigenous art forms from other cultures um, in relation to genealogical connections and cultural connections. I'm assuming this is a universal theme, conveying information and history through art. Yeah, that's a really insightful or question, uh, kind of a comment or a question. And um, uh, it definitely is something that is probably, I, I mean, I'm speaking from maybe my, my hat as a professor in indigenous studies and thinking about, how I talk to my students about, uh, you know, moving away from the linear Western kind of framing of how we represent and talk about Indigenous people and identity to 
indigenous philosophy for understanding the world around them and their relationships in it. And it's, it is that kind of relational understanding. It's a, you know, a collective relational understanding, not so much the individual. And, uh, and so in that sense, I do think that something that is commonly shared across many indigenous cultures and relates to the way in which uh, children are taught, for example, through observation, how you know, human beings understand themselves in relationship to the plants and animals and water and uh, kind of in a one of reciprocal responsibility to each other rather than in one of extraction, which uh, dominates kind of the, the Western understanding of the relationship between humans and nature. Um, and so that definitely um, manifests itself through these various traditional arts because they are so much interconnected with um, practical use as well as uh, the spiritual uh, way in which they're uh, imbued with um, spiritual power uh, as well within very, you know, very cult indigenous cultures can be very different, but uh, nonetheless, there can be that kind of shared understanding of the relationship between the, the quote unquote material world, what kind of Western uh, framing would be this material versus spiritual, those things are not so much um, separated out, but seen as in relation to each other and in reci reciprocal relation. Uh, we had another question about if you're looking for employees or graduate students for your projects, and I will encourage um, that questioner to email you maybe. Yeah. Best mm -hmm. way. Um, and Heather's email is in the chat, howardh at msu.edu. Um, but that is a good question. Um, is your project- Yes, get in touch. Yep, please do get in touch. Um, uh, one final note while we're waiting to see if anybody has any final questions. I am putting in the chat, um, I think it was 2015, Yvonne walker Kishik was here doing a lecture, a hybrid history talk, just like this about quill work. Um, and we recorded it and she allowed us to post it on our YouTube page. And so I am linking that down in the chat. You are all very welcome to, um, to watch that. I believe she answers some of the questions um, about material gathering and, and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, also very quickly before I, uh, before I lose all of you, um, I am putting in the chat as well, um, a quick, uh, it's a, a link to a survey. So this is a feedback survey about our uh, history talk series and about this survey. Um, and it's a fillable PDF that you can then immediately send back to us. And I hope that you will take a moment, please, to fill that out. We really, really appreciate your feedback um, and uh, look forward to hearing from all of you. So that is also in the chat. Um, and I'm doing one last look here to see if we have any final questions. I do have one that was sent to me privately that's asking, um, uh, I think it's related to some of the quill boxes being out west. Was, is quill work practiced in other, uh, do other indigenous groups make quill work? Oh, most definitely, yes. Uh, throughout, throughout North America where porcupines are found, and actually in other countries where porcupines are found uh, in Africa, there are por por giant porcupines that uh, are utilized uh, as well. So the, that uh, in interesting use of animal material for sure that is uh, definitely applied in different, very different kinds of techniques in different cultural areas, but um, uh, is not just specific to the Great Lakes area, but I, I have to say Waganaxing community in particular is like the epicenter of uh, this kind of coal work in the Great Lakes region, definitely. Oh, Jenna wants to add something there. Thank you. Uh, the Great Lakes area um, has a specific time or the porcupines that are here uh, the quills are very different than porcupines that you'll find out west. Out west, they're really thick and they're mostly white with like a black tip. Um, but here they have like the gradient. So that's one reason why Yvonne is able to um, have such value in her, um, like um, artistic value in her uh, 
I want if you uh, like shadows, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, how she can create shadows like within her like artwork is because these specific porcupines have that. Um, yeah. Yeah, the kind of gra gradation of the color. Yeah. Yeah. She exactly. really plays with that well. Yeah. So that I know people, it's very sought after, like out west, if people who want to practice that kind of um, quill work, they look for porcupines from our area um, just because they're not able to get it. Another interesting point, too, to just kind of think historically about. Um, international trade between First Nations throughout the Americas too that long precedes Europeans. I'm sure porcupine quills were a part of that too. Right. Well, I do believe that that was the last question. Um, so I will just say thank you so much for, for joining us, Miigwech, um, for being here with us and telling us about your project. Um, again, there is a link to a survey in the chat. Uh, Heather put her email in the chat. Um, if you have any other questions or you um, would like to reach out about this lecture or about any of our others, you can feel free to email the Historical Society or give us a call. And again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks, Heather. Good evening. Bye.